So welcome everybody to our final workshop of the summer, although today is the first day of fall. My name is Emily Bell Dynan, and I am from the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. I'll go into that in a little bit about what that means. But tonight's talk is called Best Practices for Sportsmen and Sportswomen to Prevent the Spread of Invasive Species. We are joined with our partners from the Montezuma Audubon Center, Chris Lajowski. Did I pronounce that correctly? Almost spot on, Emily okay. Lajeski. Lajeski, all right, thank you. A little bit um, of a roadmap for this evening. I'm gonna move, gonna move some things around on my screen. A little bit of a roadmap for tonight. We'll go through some introductions. I've partially introduced Chris, but we have a little bit more info to give you on him. We're gonna go through, or he's gonna go through what an invasive species is pathways to their spread across New York State and really wherever you're recreating. Uh, then jumping into species to know. So aquatic plants, terrestrial plants, and invasive insects that are really, really key to understand what they look like and what they do on the landscape so that you can help, help us help you control them to protect ecological resources, economic resources, and social resources. Then we'll jump into how to take action and I'll give an overview of something called IMAP Invasives, which I sent to you a link and a lot of facts about in your email this morning. So we'll jump into understanding what that means, how we use it, why we use it, and how we can get you to start using it as well to help us manage the Adirondacks. With our last 15 minutes from about 6.45 to 7, we'll have some Q&A. So before we get to the Q&A, I'm gonna just keep admitting a few people here. Um, before we get to the Q&A, if you want to uh, type your questions into the chat box, that'll help me sort of park those ideas, so to speak, so that we can revisit them at the end. I don't want anybody to lose a thought, um, but we also don't have that much time tonight, so I don't want to interrupt Chris. Uh, without further ado, I'll jump into the first part of our agenda, which are introductions. And I will introduce, oops, hold on. I will introduce our program. So I mentioned I'm from the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. Um, typically of a slide that also has my contact info on here, but I will share my contact info with you again with follow-up emails. My name is Emily Bell Dynan. As I said, I'm the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program's Education Outreach Coordinator. We also go by the acronym APIP. So maybe you've heard of APIP before if you live and work in the Adirondacks or are a seasonal resident up here. You might also be familiar with one of the other eight PRISMs or Partnership for Regional Invasive Plant Management that dot the rest of uh, New York State. So our territory is up here. And can I confirm everyone can see my screen? Is that correct? Okay, great. Um, so APIP's territory is up here. We cover all six million acres of Adirondack Park, uh, which is no big deal whatsoever. Uh, over to Lake Champlain and our neighbors to the east, Vermont, and then our neighbors to the north. We stop at the Canadian border. We also have uh, prisms in Long Island, the Lower Hudson Valley, Catskill region, the Albany Capital Mohawk region, the St. Lawrence Lake Ontario area, Finger Lakes where Chris is tonight, and that's a prism partner that he works with closely, and then over to Western New York. So if you're zooming in from another part of our state, part of our follow-up information will be how to connect you to a PRISM partner in your area. So Zoom has really melted boundaries and allowed us to travel back and forth for different educational reasons, which is really, really excellent and an unexpected positive consequence. Um, APIP is a program of the Nature Conservancy and we're funded by the New York State Department for Environmental Conservation. Our goals are to prevent new introductions of invasive species to our prism geography. And we do that um, in a myriad of ways. However, through partnerships, prevention outreach, education, citizen science training, um, and direct management in terrestrial spaces and aquatic spaces is really how we carry out our work. We rapidly detect and eradicate new infestations in order to keep it, the smaller it is, the more cost effective and really logistically possible it is to eradicate and control new infestations. 
um, and we'll get into that a little bit later with why we use something called IMAP and why we rely on volunteers like yourselves to be trained and ready and willing and able to use uh, reporting software and mapping software. And then we manage existing priority infestations in order to mitigate impacts. So uh, a number of you may have heard throughout the news this summer that we have two new insects on the landscape in our prism area that are, you know, they're, they're present in other parts of the state and other parts of the country, but they're new to the Adirondack. So the emerald ash borer, which Chris is gonna talk about, and hemlock woolly adelgid, um, which Chris is also going to talk about. So both of these things are, both of these insects are priority new infestations that really, really um, threaten forest health. We'll talk about that as well, but there's a lot we can do to mitigate those impacts. And then I'm going to introduce our wonderful speaker tonight, um, Chris Legit. Le Help me Don't out again. Lejowski? <laughs> Lejowski. Lejowski. I'm so sorry. No one can ever pronounce my last name, and I, I promise to never do that to other people. I'm kind of off tonight. Um, Chris is a passionate conservationist and birder. He's a native of Pittsburgh, New York. Chris began his career with Audubon, with Audubon New York in 2010 as the Montezuma Audubon Center's education manager, and you were promoted to the center director in 2013. Chris graduated with honors from SUNY Albany with a bachelor's of science in geology and obtained a master's of science in geology from Syracuse University, where he researched human impacts on the Finger Lakes. After college, he worked as, for an environmental consulting company the National Park Service, the Walker Nature Center, and the Nature Conservancy. So we're proud to call him an alumnus of the Nature Conservancy as well. Chris is a proud husband and father and enjoys hunting, camping, paddling, swimming, and enjoying time with his wife and children. And we're so happy to have you here tonight, Chris. Thank you for sharing all your information um, and knowledge as a passionate uh, sportsman and local food enthusiast. And um, it's been really great to get to know you through this experience. Thank you, Emily, and thank you all for joining us this evening on the first day of fall. It's a beautiful evening, so Emily and I really appreciate you taking time out of your schedules to be indoors with us, or maybe you're outside with us, so enjoying this beautiful evening, but uh, listening in on what we can all do as sportsmen and women to prevent the spread of invasive species across the Adirondacks, New York State, and really uh, across the globe. This is something that everyone is dealing with. It's not just an Adirondack or Montezuma issue. This is an issue that spans the entire globe. And so because of that, it is critical that we do all that we can at home in our communities to reduce the spread. That's how we are going to get things in control and improve the habitat for birds, other wildlife, and the enjoyment of people. Next, please. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're gonna do just that. We're gonna talk about uh, some, uh, well, first I'm gonna showcase a little bit about Audubon, our uh, nonprofit organization that I work for, our goal, our mission here, and just a, a touch on our broader organization um, and encourage you, of course, to come visit us out at the Montezuma Audubon Center at your convenience. Uh, and then we're going to dive into some of those critical species that we need to be on the lookout for, aquatic, terrestrial, and a couple of insects that Emily mentioned. And then I'm going to turn it back over to Emily for uh, a nice discussion on IMAP invasives, which is an incredibly useful tool that we can all use to inform scientists uh, and educators about the spread of invasives in our communities. So Audubon has been in existence since 1905. We are one of the leading bird conservation organizations uh, on the planet and our mission is to protect birds in the places that they need, not only for today but also for tomorrow. And I just had to showcase a common loon here for this Adirondack based uh, presentation here this evening. Certainly one of my favorites. Next. The National Audubon Society works now across the entire Western Hemisphere. We follow birds. Birds guide our work. 
we started off in 1905 in New York City, small organization, uh, some folks, birders getting together, concerned about what they were seeing on the landscape, the loss of habitats leading to the loss of birds. And that was, that was fine. We didn't have the science at that point to understand that birds are actually migrating um, they're, they're in some cases traveling 12,000 miles one way to go from wintering grounds to breeding grounds and they have to go another 12,000 miles back. So we now though have this full life cycle approach to conservation. And we need that approach because if we don't conserve habitat at stop over sites during migration as well as in wintering grounds, then all the work that we're doing up here across New York State, across this country, and up into Canada is, is going to be for naught because we're not preserving habitats across their entire life cycle. Next, please. So one of the biggest threats to birds and, that we love is invasive species. Certainly climate change is right up there, and we're seeing the devastating effects of that right now. Um, and, and habitat loss just has been detrimental to, to many of our bird species over the last couple hundred years here in this country. But invasive species are cert is certainly right up there as a top threat to the birds that we love. Uh, so next, please. So invasive species are alien species. These are introduced species from another part of the planet. And, and they've been brought here in large part by humans. Now that introduction may be intentional, it could be accidental, but in either case, it's humans that have moved species, plants, animals, insects, um, from, from one part of the world to another, where they cause three things. Economic harm, so that's a direct impact on our uh, or wallets and bank accounts, okay? Either in a family situation, personally, or in, in communities. They're, they're causing economic harm because of the cost that it takes to control them or the, the kind of indirect impacts that it has on a community. So there's economic harm. Certainly there's environmental harm with an invasive species. Now, not all introduced species become invasive species. Uh, I like to think of, well, tulips, for example. So tulips, I have them out in my front yard and love them in the springtime. You know, beautiful colors, as long as I can keep the deer away from them. Uh, just beautiful, beautiful species, not native to this country. It's an introduced species, but it's not an invasive species. It doesn't take over, doesn't cause these three harms uh, to us. So just want to make that clarification for you. The third thing is that there could be, there's harm to human health um, with, with some invasive species, not all. But uh, the, there are a few species um, that actually can be very harmful to, to humans. Um, and um, blanking on the giant hogweed is the one I was trying to come up with there. Giant hogweed, uh, which I won't be showing today, so I'll just briefly mention this now. Uh, it's certainly here in the Finger Lakes region, we've had issues with it. It has the sap, and if you're out mowing a hedgerow or uh, clearing some land and the sap gets on your skin, and the, the sun hits your skin with that sap on it, you get a nasty, nasty burn. Uh, DEC is doing a great job right now trying to control it here in the Finger Lakes. Uh, so keep an eye out for it. And you've got great people like Emily that are educating the communities about species to be on the lookout for if they haven't yet reached their prism area. So uh, giant hogweed is certainly one that causes uh, harm to human health. Next, please. So, what's the? Yeah, you got it. Yep. So, what's what's the problem here? Let's let's dive down deeper into these issues here, uh, really from an environmental perspective. Next, please. Um, the impacts are significant. Um, decrease in biodiversity. So you're 
for example, we have phones. We have phones here, and you have uh, probably a lot of apps on your phone. Okay, so imagine that that is going to that's high diversity of of apps. Let's say, for example, in this situation here. Well, if an invasive species comes in, you have a monoculture. It's like having one app. You may have lots of different symbols on your phone, but it's 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 all the same app. Uh, so you're decreasing the diversity of apps on your phone. That's that's what I mean when I say there's a decrease in biodiversity. You're going from a healthy variety of, of species in an ecosystem, but when an invasive species comes in and chokes out the other species and prevents them from thriving, you've got a monoculture. You've got essentially one species there. So that's a negative impact, a significant impact on uh, ecosystems is that decrease in biodiversity. Uh, altering ecosystem processes. A great example of this is uh, when non-native Phragmites moves into an area. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Phragmites. I'll go into a little bit more detail later on in this presentation. Phragmites can uh, dry out. It can choke out wetland habitats. It could be growing roadside, but on those those early spring days when we get some nice warm weather coming in, 60 degrees, 70 degrees, the south wind is blowing, but it's dry wind, we have no humidity in the air, that can be the uh, lead to a spark in wildfires across our region. And I'll never forget, I back in my Nature Conservancy days, I had that situation happen up in Pulaski where, uh, where a, a neighbor was trying to burn some brush and it got out of control. And next thing you know, we've got some of the field on fire, plus the, the Phragmites that was growing nearby. So it was dried out, it hadn't greened up yet, causing a, a pretty significant fire in our ecosystem. Um, it's also actually, we've had, uh, when I worked in Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge in New York City, in Queens and Brooklyn, we've, we've also had extreme wildfires from Phragmites as well, where it dominates salt marshes there. Yeah, devastating impacts for sure. Um, many of our ecosystems have threatened and endangered species in them, and they need the native vegetation in order to survive. In our neck of the woods, uh, in, in the Finger Lakes region, we, you know, we're replanting areas with white oak and red oak, um, hemlock and pine trees and, and black cherry trees, just to name a few. Those are, um, you know, probably familiar uh, species that you've got up in the Adirondacks, but maybe a little bit different, higher peaks. You're, you've got uh, some different evergreens uh, and probably some different hardwoods down um, in the lower elevation areas. But these are all spe plant species that are required by species like uh, cerulean warbler, for example, or wood thrush. Um, uh, hermit thrush, um, oh, spruce grouse is, is uh, threatened, certainly threatened species of the Adirondacks, and, and they all need native vegetation. So when you have an invasive moving in, that's going to make it difficult for T and E species to um, survive. Lastly, expensive to control. Um, I've got direct uh, evidence of this here. Just yesterday, I had. Uh, five ash trees taken down in the back here. We've all got ash in our backyards. It was lined up behind everyone's backyard and emerald ash borer has come in. I've been slowly watching the, uh, those uh, trees die over the last several years and finally this year they were completely dead, those five. Um, so boy, hit to the pocketbook for sure. So uh, some of the significant impacts of invasive species right here for you. Next please. I alluded to this earlier, it's, it's really humans that are moving these species around. And when you go to the next slide here, you'll see the list. And I want you to think of what is the common component to these pathways here that I listed. Waterways, shipping routes, train tracks, roads, trade, plant imports, recreation, hiking, camping, hunting. Um, travel more. What's the common denominator here? Humans, right? 
we are moving around science so easily now uh, in many ways. And as, because we predator, we have a responsibility to make sure that all species that we share this wonderful place will have a chance to survive. So, um, it's so to know what invasive species are in your community in the Adirondacks or knocking on the door to the Adirondack so that you can acknowledge, be on the lookout for, remove those invasives when they come in and quickly plant with native vegetation after the invasives are removed. But of these paths, I've lost the screen. Suddenly my Zoom went out. I, am, I apologize. Um, I'm gonna go on, I'm gonna turn my video off. And Chris, if you turn your video off too, that would be great. But we'll keep, everyone will still be able to hear us. Okay. If I can do this here. Stop video. Stop video. Okay. All right. So you keep going, Chris, and I apologize. So we were talking about how humans are directly related to the transport of invasive species through travel and how we have to pay attention to that in our behaviors and activities. Yes. And uh, are you working on getting the presentation back up? Oh, I apologize. I didn't realize it had stopped sharing. Let me take care of that. Sorry. There we go. I look forward to the day where we don't have to Zoom anymore. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you, uh, Emily. Uh, yes. Yeah, so next, next slide here. Right. So, so we're looking at the of a sportsman and I, I do just want to preface this by saying I'm a sportsman and I'm a proud sportsman and uh, I didn't grow up with hunting in my family. Um, family and friends never did it. I was always outside and, and loved the outdoors of course but that is something new to me and I wanted to do it because I wanted to be part of the solution. I wanted to bring nature back into balance and I wanted to bring the white-tailed deer population down and our resident Canada goose population down back into check. Those are, those are a couple species that have just gone out of control. Um, you know, there were good interventions early on back in the early 1900s, but those species have, have grown exponentially and are too large for our ecosystems now. So we need to bring nature back into balance here. That's why I do it. Um, that's why, well, in, in part why I do it. I, of course love the game and, and we eat of course everything I bring home family loves it my daughters and wife love it and I love to cook now I didn't know I was uh, such a chef so it's it's certainly part of our livelihood now and I just wanted to lay that out there because people think of Audubon and you think oh Chris aren't you a tree hugging granola eating Birkenstock wearing uh, Grateful Dead and listening hippie well I do enjoy all that but I'm also a sportsman <laughs> so just laying it all out there for you and uh, and happy to talk more about that uh, if you are interested at the end here today. So how can we prevent the spread of invasives as sportsmen and sportswomen? Well, from the aquatic perspective, and this is important because right now we are in a early waterfowl season. Um, I've got just a few more days of early Canada goose season down here in the Finger Lakes region. I believe you've uh, You've probably also either had it or still in that early goose season up north. But it's all about clean draining and drying your gear when talking about rem uh, removing the chances of invasive aquatic species. Uh, so cleaning, uh, you're, you're cleaning all of your gear from your, your apparel, your waders, your hip boots, to your, your watercraft, uh, your, your decoys, your waterfowl decoys you're putting out there in the marsh or in the river uh, and making sure it is clean before you leave that area. 
you, you, you're certainly welcome. And I do this all the time where I move from one marsh to another or one lake to another, but you got to make sure that it's cleaned before you leave that area. You're leaving any chance that there are invasive species on your gear um, and leave that all behind. You want to drain the water from any part of your, for your watercraft um, before you leave that water body. Um, you know, ballast water, anything that you've got in there has to be drained before moving on to a different waterway. If you're like me and you're moving around a lot during the day, it's not, you can't wait for it to completely dry. So wiping your gear and your boat, you know, canoe, kayak, even supplies uh, with a towel before going on to another area. So clean, drain, dry. Uh, easy to remember. Uh, if you want more details, go to Stop Aquatic uh, Hitchhikers.org. That's where I got this basic information, this common knowledge, but this is a great resource for sportsmen and sportswomen. Other things to think about don't forget your boots. Uh, non felt soled boots uh, will not uh, very as easily pick up seeds and hitchhikers and, and burrs and things and, and uh, to transport. So uh, non felt sold boots are important. Elliptical or bulb shaped anchors, anything with, without a pointy uh, end to it, is, it's gonna be harder for invasive plant species to grab on to that or get, get a hold of those, uh, the anchors. So that's something you can keep in mind. And then I threw this in here, buying locally in terms of firewood. You know, when we go off on a camping excursion, a hunting excursion, sometimes we're spending the night or we're getting an early start and we make a little fire to, to stay warm at night. Buy local firewood. Um, there are five trees in my back now, I'll cut up nice, but no way I'm letting that move from my yard. I'm gonna burn it. We have campfires in the back with the kids or we're gonna burn in the fireplace um, over the next couple of years. But buy local, don't move firewood. Key to remember. Next please. Okay, um, so this then is um, kind of geared towards your, your uh, sportsman now. Um, again, it's going to be very similar to what you see with the aquatic invasive species, but you're, you want to start the day with clean shoes and gear. Um, double check, make sure you got all those burrs off, they get those seeds off. I'm going to be identifying some of those seeds here in just a minute as we go into the species. It's got to be on the lookout for. Um, important to remove those um, as early as you can. I, I love this this burr removal here that I've got in my pack. Oh, you can't see it now. That's right. But but there's a, a lot of burr removal and seed removal tools out there that fit easily in your pack. You can you can get those burrs and seeds off before you leave the field, before you get in your car and, and head off to the next forest where you're going to sit for the afternoon or, or at the end of the day before you go home. So really key to, to leave whatever you can right there uh, where you possibly picked it up. Um, this, this next part here, staying on marked or designated trails, that's, you know, as sportsmen, you know, we're moving around. We're moving around a lot and we're going through in the backcountry areas, well off trail. Yeah, but, um, but in some cases, you know, we're walking on marked or designated trails in order to get out to our bushwhack area. So, so if you stay on those, those marked areas and trails as, as often as you can before you get off trail and into the back country, that's gonna be important. Um, you're, you're, you know, you're gonna be able to, to stay on, maybe it's a, a mowed grassy trail or it's a stone dust trail or a gravel, old gravel road you know, that, that hopefully doesn't have too many invasive plant species growing on it. So staying on that as long as you can in order to, to get to your favorite hunting grounds. Uh, the handheld boot brush is great. Uh, great, again, from removing seeds and, and um, invasive uh, seeds and burrs. That, that's key. 
um, or just waiting until you get back to your, your truck and, and you've got like a boot scrubber or a boot brush there. Take care of it. Uh, the other thing I'll just mention here briefly is don't forget your pets. Uh, you know, a lot of us are going to be out there waterfowl hunting, pheasant hunting, small game hunting for rabbits. Uh, you might be out there with dogs. Uh, don't forget your dogs. They might be carrying invasive seeds. They may have ticks on them too. Something else to keep in mind, an entirely different presentation that we could probably uh, get a hold of here, Emily, as we get into the, the later into the hunting season. But yeah, check, check the dogs, uh, make sure they're not carrying burrs. Next. Yeah, so what are some of the plants? We're gonna focus here initially on a few of the aquatic in, uh, invasive species, uh, plant species that is. Hydrilla, this is one that I'm, I'm familiar with. Fortunately, I have not seen it yet, but it is here in the Finger Lakes region and I know it's knocking on the door. It's one of your early detection rapid response plants for the Adirondacks. Hydrilla was first found here in the state in 2008. It's kind of spread from southern part of the state and it's gotten up here into the Finger Lakes region, Wayne County, uh, excuse me, Monroe County in Rochester, as well as over in Buffalo. It is in KU Lake. We did find it there a few years ago. It was first found at the inlet. It's been found most recently up towards the northern section of uh, the lake. And that's of concern to me as the director of the Montezuma Audubon Center, because that is really knocking on the door here in this Montezuma wetlands complex. We partnered with our uh, colleagues at the Finger Lakes Prism, Hobart and William Smith Colleges. We've sent out volunteers to search for hydrilla. And fortunately, we have not found it within our, our water bodies and wetlands yet, uh, but we're gonna be uh, vigilant. We're going to stay on top of it because you need to find that population when it's small and remove it uh, quickly thereafter. But uh, something to, to be cognizant of, uh, certainly in the Adirondacks. This is a nice image here, a nice close-up image is followed by uh, a drawing down below just so you can see the detail of, yeah, thank you, Emily, that, that five world leaves there around the stems. Notice the serrated edges of those leaflets there uh, are indicative. There are a few native lookalikes, um, and I've looked long and hard at many of those species, and it, I, was, I was worried initially when uh, I saw those worlds of five, but the, they didn't happen. They didn't uh, have the serrated edges, so I knew it was the native. But many things that, that this species and many aquatic species will do is that they, they choke out the habitat, of course, make it very difficult for canoeing, kayaking, motorboats, uh, swimming, direct impacts on fish by, out, uh, by really it's gonna outcompete the native aquatic vegetation, which in many cases is really important for our waterfowl. So this is a direct threat to waterfowl enthusiasts and sportsmen out there. Um, the waterfowl they need the native seeds right now to, to bolster their uh, energy and reserves to get ready for migration and survive the winter. So um, this is a, a big one that we're on the lookout for and I encourage you to be vigilant uh, with as well. Another species that I am directly familiar with and have hands-on experience, unfortunately, with is water chestnut. It is fairly common throughout most of the state, as you can see there, another image from New York State DEC here. But notice the backcountry of the Adirondacks, really not an issue yet. So this is, truly is an, e, an early detection rabbit response or EDRR species. Um, notice the rosettes. The, the rosettes that are in this rosette pad, the individual leaflets are triangular serrated leaves. Uh, the flowers themselves are four, you can see right in the middle there is a small flower, four uh, uh, petals on that flower, and the nutlets are incredible. They're like an alien species. And move to the next one, Emily. 
we can show people that yes, the those nutlets. Uh, you talk about getting hurt by invasive species. Well, here's one that causes literal harm uh, to to you if you step on this. If you're you know swimming, if you're uh, out waterfowl hunting or fishing, and you happen to to puncture your foot, um, you know, with this, you're going to know it. It's going to cause some damage to you. But um, you know, this is the time of year when these nutlets are forming. The seeds are, themselves are actually inside these nutlets here, and uh, it, they're floating around. They're um, they're very easily moved. They're very very easily picked up by uh, by boats by your gear. So be cognizant of these black uh, nutlets that are about an inch and a half or so, two inches or so in diameter air from tip to tip just to put that into perspective yeah it's almost i'd say that well it's a little bit larger than actual size they're a little, actually a little bit smaller than what you're seeing on the screen right there but causing devastating harm uh, to our aquatic ecosystems making it very challenging to to paddle through because those rosettes of leaves float on the water um, and of course the nut well, let's cause physical harm to us Next, please. Eurasian water milfoil is one that I, I know is, you know, fairly common again across most of the state in those backwater areas. It, it's not found yet. We've got it fairly abundantly in the Montezuma wetlands complex, but it's a submerged aquatic vegetation. Notice these um, finely divided. Uh, pairs of leaflets that we have and the uh, Eurasian water milfoil can grow up to, well 15 feet 18 feet in length uh, very impressive uh, <laughs> very aggressive aquatic invasive species for sure um, oh and I see somebody uh, just sent a chat message there I didn't see it but uh, I do want to mention this this reproduces by fragmentation. So I'm familiar with the southern part of the Adirondacks. My family has a camp there and occasionally we'll get up there and they are, have an active harvesting program which has removed most of the Eurasian water milfoil from at least right in front of the camps and, and all the cottages are, are in on this together. But you know when you when you can't harvest all of it and you let some of the vegetation spread or just float around in the, in the water body, well, that can lead to new infestation. So if you do end up trying to manage this or, or you hire, hire a harvester, make sure you do all you can to secure all of those fragments and don't allow them to root and cause new problems. Next, please. Yeah, and oh, um, a little bit more about uh, this one here. It's, uh, um, th I think that's the biggest issue is that fragmentation piece and the thick nature of it. And just like all the other aquatic species, this is gonna cause uh, devastating impacts to the aquatic uh, ecosystem, both freshwater and brackish water. So if any of you are joining us from downstate, you know, Hudson River or uh, off the coast, Long Island Sound area, be cognizant of this species, identify it, and then let the proper prism uh, folks know about it. Um, just to add that, you know, in the Adirondacks, milfoil is unfortunately quite present. And so cleaning, draining, and drying your boat between water bodies is of the utmost importance um, in particular for this plant. And um, for more details on a lot of these different plants, um, going deeper in depth, even about milfoil itself and how to manage it. Say if you have a lake association or a homeowner association that you're calling in from today, like Chris just mentioned, his family participates in. Uh, we have a lot of detailed uh, recorded videos and webinars and seminars from this past summer about all different types of aquatic invasive species, and then also just on managing milfoil. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm gonna keep going, and I'm gonna turn my video off so that I don't crash the system. But I'm here.
Great. And, uh, here's a new one that's on our radar here in the Finger Lakes. It's called Japanese stilt grass. First honor with this was working at the Walker Nature Center down in Reston, Virginia. It seems to be prevalent down in the mid Atlantic state. Is just now starting to creep up here into New York. We've got scattered patches of it across the Montezuma Woodlands complex. Um, it's a, a fairly low growing grass. Uh, generally, we're finding it a foot, maybe two feet tall, is all it is. Uh, leaves are really short. Um, they've, they've got that, that off center mid uh, rib there, that weight line that comes down the length of the stem and they're alternating on either side of the stem so then they're, they're going back and forth right left right left as you work your way down the stem um, it blooms in uh, late summer so it's blooming now and into this early fall season uh, and uh, the the seeds that are going to form you see on the left there that inch that is going to produce, you know, potentially thousands and thousands of new Japanese still grass seeds. Fortunately, I guess the one benefit of this here is that this is an annual grass. It's not perennial. So annual, it, it will not go from the same root system next year that it grew in this year. So that plant is it reproduces and continues as a species through those seeds. So if you're talking management, and we can go into the next one here, management of this species. Uh, there's a couple options here for if you don't want to use chemicals and certainly we try not to whenever we can but in some cases it is it is required to deal with invasive species here at Montezuma. But this one you can simply mow it if you want to try to reduce the population you can mow it you know before um, I'd say kind of early summer season you can mow and you know, right before it goes to seed because then the plant is using a lot of resources, a lot of energy, and um, there may not be much left in the soil for it to cold the next year. The seed bank can be extensive and that seed bank is incredibly uh, tough to deal with because those seeds can stay viable for well over 10 years. So even though you're controlling the population of seeds this year, there's nine other years of of seeds that are in the soil ready to sprout potentially. Uh, so something you gotta be dil dil diligent on. The other thing is that this plant is very easy to hand pull. So this is a great one if you're looking to get out and volunteer and remove invasive plant species or looking to get some family members or community members together and focus on an invasive species. That's something we do a lot of at Montezuma. We've got an army of volunteers that help us come out. Uh, that come out with us and remove invasives. And this is one that so everyone from five to 95 years old can do because it has almost no root system can very easily be pulled up out of the ground. Next please. Another one I'm all familiar with here, the swallowers. This one is related to milkweed. So you're going to notice there that those seed pods, those those light green seed pods in the circuit, they look like milkweed. It's really narrow milkweed seeds compared to the common milkweed, and because it's it's in the milkweed uh, family, monarch butterflies will lay their eggs on it. But this plant is poisonous to monarch caterpillars, so they end up dying. Um, and I've seen some horrific scenes up in the North Country around Chameau Barrens, uh, up in the Alvar habitat just west of Watertown, where there are fields and forests inundated with uh, swallowwort. So we've kind of jumped now from the aquatic system to the terrestrial here with uh, this swallowwort plant. Uh, being next slide here, Emily. Be on the lookout now for this plant. Uh, it is fairly prolific here in the Finger Lakes region. Um, I know you're, you're dealing with it in spots up in the Adirondacks as well. Uh, probably not as bad as what we're dealing with uh, down in the lowlands area. But, but mowing is something that you can do. You can pull pods. You can, um, gosh, you can uh, spray it 
if needed, but you have to stay up with it. Like all these, you have to continue the management of these species. Otherwise you, you let it go one year and you lose 10 years. Uh, something we found out, um, you know, the way in some, so this is one that very easily gets on your gear as you're walking in and out, you know, for turkey season coming up, for upcoming deer season, be on the lookout for it. And really important to take that burr brush that, um, that's gonna take off the seeds um, of this one. It, it spreads just like milkweed. It has those white parachutes on it, very easily blows in the wind. Next one. Uh, probably a common one for many of you, the common reed. The, the genus is Phragmites, so it, it oftentimes will go by the term Phragmites. There is the a native form of, of Phragmites, um, but it looks entirely different. It's not nearly as tall. This non-native Phragmites can be anywhere from, oh, I've seen it as low as five feet. It can be as high as 12, 15 feet high. Dense, thick vegetation, I mentioned it dries out. Look at that left-hand picture there, how it dries out. That's kind of a, uh, early spring, kind of late winter image there. So just dry vegetation, ready to go up in a spark, uh, causing potential uh, forest fire there. Um, yeah, so next one there, I can, uh, and, and what to be on the lookout for. You're gonna find this in wetlands, certainly, but it's also in uh, roadside ditches. So getting out of your vehicle and getting into your, your, your hunting grounds area. Be on the lookout for this. It does spread by seeds, but it can also spread through rhizomes or the root systems of the plant. Um, so if you're hunting for fowl, if you're, if you're going out into your forest and habitat looking for deer, be on the lookout for common reed um, or Phragmites, and um, it can grow in a lot of different habitats. Really is not picky in terms of of soil type in terms of uh, um, even water uh, abundance, you know, moisture content in the soil. I've seen it growing on dry hills and of course ditches and wetlands as well. Next please. I think, uh, I think we got just one more um, species. So kind of going back into the wetland environment now, but not, not aquatic and not uh, standing water here. This is more of a wetland species, so it can be wet meadow habitat. Um, it's a beautiful plant. And that's probably, well, we know one of the reasons why it was brought here. It was a beautiful plant over in, in Europe and Asia, and as people were immigrating here, they wanted to bring a piece of home, which is understandable coming to a new land, but they just didn't understand how this was going to impact our native ecosystems here. And, and uh, up until about 30 years ago, we here, even here in Tizuma, had marshes and marshes and marshes filled with purple loosestrife. Um, but because of the science and technology evolving, and, and we partnered with U.S. Department of Agriculture and Cornell University, we studied the, the native insects that are over in Europe and Asia that only eat purple loosestrife. If we can go to the next slide here, because the next slide lists uh, those, those critters that eat this plant. So there's the Garrasella beetle, uh, which, which eats the leaves, and then you've got a root-eating weevil, uh, plus you've got some seed-eating beetles. So we're attacking it three ways, and we're not going to get rid of all the purple loosestrife. Never going to happen, but it's to the point where now purple loosestrife is just kind of a naturalized plant here in the Montezuma wetlands complex. So we're not going to eradicate it. We understand, but not the issue that it was. So there's, a, there's an issue. There's a plant species where we have taken some, some biocontrol efforts, uh, studied them extensively, making sure those insects only eat purple loosestrife and release them on the land once we were confident that that was the case and a positive result. So we're making more uh, suitable native natural habitat for waterfowl species. 
um, for beaver and muskrat, um, and of course deer as well as they're you know moving from forest area to bedding area to to feeding grounds. You know we're going to find deer, of course, in wetlands too. So they they've got more more habitat um, uh, with native vegetation to eat. Next slide. There we go. Yeah, and just a couple of quickly here, a couple of insects that I wanted to highlight. I mentioned the emerald ash borer now. Uh, it, it's knocking on the door in the Adirondacks. It's something that I've been watching here in the Finger Lakes region. We're seeing big die off in ash trees across the Montezuma wetlands complex. Um, I first came, was introduced to this back in my nature conservancy days up in the North Country where we, we think we found the first infestation of emerald ash borer up by Watertown. Um, and it's just kind of you know, spread out all over most of the state now. Uh, you're looking for these D-shaped exit holes, of course, um, uh, as well as the galleries of the beetles, the larvae underneath the bark. A uh, very distinctive gallery of tunnels there. Um, and we're seeing just massive die offs. So, the next slide, please. Uh, and this is really critical for sportsmen, for camping. Uh, don't move firewood. The, there could be emerald ash borer still in your cut ash. Um, it's causing significant harm to our ecosystems, specifically our, our swamp habitats. Uh, so direct impacts to, to wood ducks, potentially deer, turkey as well, devastating. And financially, it's crippling as well. Look at that, $10.7 billion in projected losses or cost, I should say, um, just in this year alone. So, um, you know, certainly you potentially could have emerald ash borer on you, unlikely, but it's possible that you could have the actual borer on you. But more likely, you know, what I'm thinking about in terms of sportsmen here is the, the move, moving of firewood from, you know, where you live to your, your favorite camp uh, where you're going to hunt with your, your friends and family here. Just don't do it by local, do it the right way. And then last here, the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's something that we're dealing with here in the Finger Lakes region. Our, our native hemlocks, especially down in the southern end of the Finger Lakes, they are dying off now because of this aphid-like insects. And what you're, what you're probably gonna notice first is not the insect itself, but you're gonna look for those woolly white masses of wax that they use to protect themselves uh, with. And, um, uh, when you see that, you're probably going to have die off of the tree within 10, maybe 20 years. Um, and we're seeing that right now down in, in the lower Finger Lakes. Again, here's an issue with firewood. Don't move firewood. You could be moving hemlock, woolly, adelgid around. Next slide. Yeah, so, so found throughout. Um, you know, there, there is a potential treatment for hemlock woolly adelgid if you're, if you're interested in that. Uh, the local PRISM group, uh, Emily sure has information on that about insecticides that you can do use to save a specimen hemlock tree you might have in your yard or at your camp that you wanna save. But again, you're gonna have to, to have multiple treatments um, uh, in order to prevent the infestation from killing your hemlock tree. And so as my tons, uh, I, I'm not going anywhere, but uh, do wanna uh, thank you again for coming out, for listening uh, about this invasive species issues that we are dealing with as sportsmen and sportswomen. Um, hopefully this was enlightening to you, uh, just, the tip of the iceberg for many of the invasive species that we're dealing with. I want to um, make a special note that New York State DEC and our local Finger Lakes Prism provided much of this information that I shared with you today. They have websites with a lot more information about invasives 
what they are, what um, last thing I'll just mention here if you're interested, program the Montezuma Audubon Center. I encourage you to go to montezuma.audubon.org. We are proud to be offering a waterfowl identification course for youth only this coming weekend. We're going to be offering a waterfowl hunt for youth coming up on October 3rd. We've got great partnerships with our environmental conservation officers, our local Federation of Sportsmen Clubs, uh, Ducks Unlimited involved. Just a great, great, unique experience for, for youth to come out and explore Montezuma in a different way. Uh, and then we're also offering a pheasant hunt coming up on October 10th. Again, that's for youth only. So, and this is all part of the 13th annual Robert F. Duro Memorial Conservation Youth Hunts, uh, something we've been proud to partner with many organizations on and bringing a new and diverse audience to Audubon through sportsman activities. We're also active on Facebook and Instagram, and, and there's my contact information if you ever want to reach out. Uh, come by and visit Savannah, New York. It's a beautiful place all year long. Thank you. Oh, unmute myself. That was excellent, Chris. Thank you so much. And um, I'm going to just um, pause sharing for just one second so that I can uh, find our my video. Oh, here we go. Sorry. Um, you're going to see me drag and drop this over here. Um, I apologize for all of our uh, funkiness tonight. Um, still always getting the hang of this. Um, so in terms of talking about also for all the excellent information that Chris shared about hemlock woolly, woolly adelgid and emerald ash borer, these are very, very serious threats to forest health in the Adirondacks. Um, New York State regulation says to not move firewood for more than 50 miles. However, in our area in the Adirondack Park region, uh, we're recommending folks move it uh, many miles less than that. It's, it's not too hard if you're camping or fishing or hunting here in the region or going on vacation. You, you can't throw a rock without finding a local stand of firewood, you know, a bundle for $5 or less. It's very affordable here. Um, and then so, you know, it's real hard to identify a tree once it's cut up. That is, most most people can't do that. You have to be a really expert forester in order to do that. Um, and so, you know, you might not know that it's ash, you might not know that it's maple, you might not know that it's oak, so on and so forth. So that's why we promote not to move firewood. There's also going to be some native insect galleries in firewood um, when you see it cut up. So it's it's best to just not move it, burn it where you buy it. And if you're buying wood this for to heat your home this winter, um, it's highly recommended in our area and elsewhere. If you can find a, sell, a wood seller who is selling kiln dried, so K-I-L-N, so if wood has been, it's not treated chemically, but it's treated with heat, um, that can kill a lot of insects as well. So that's something we're recommending people do um, to keep the Adirondack safe, to keep forest safe, to keep Finger Lake safe. Because uh, these insects don't, you know, have boundaries, but, um, or they do, they can't travel very far, but people don't have boundaries. So um, be cognizant of that as you, you know, in, buy your firewood this winter. Um, so I just want to give you a few slides. We've talked about ways you know, what to look for. We've talked about ways to prevent the spread. And I just wanna jump into again, you know, report sightings. Chris had amazing maps from our partners at the Finger Lakes Prism, but how do those maps get made? Um, they're made with a lot of input from citizen scientists like yourselves. So I keep pushing this app called IMAP Invasives and I'm gonna, I'm gonna just keep doing it um until everybody uses it because it's also really fun i don't know if anybody got into the pokemon go craze of about four years ago but it is something that you can do and you know get in the habit of using when you're hunt hiking hunting biking camping just walking the dog um, it's a nonprofit mapping tool created by and for natural resource practitioners in order to understand the distribution of and manage infestations 
and prevent infestations of invasive plants and animals. It's used in multiple states across the United across the country, as well as in parts of central Canada. So my previous work in Oregon, we were using IMAP invasives. My current work in New York, we're using IMAP invasives. Uh, we use it to set our priorities and know where to work. As I mentioned, it's six million acres that we're working in. So if we don't know something's there, we can't go fix it. It's, um, we have mentioned this early detect rapid response um, method to control invasive species before they get out of control. So this is really our early detection tool. This is our fire alarm and we will, you know, we don't necessarily have a fire pole. We would if we had an office, but we don't. Uh, no, we have an office. We're just not working in it right now. Um, so this tool allows us to carry out our early detection and rapid response for invasive species in the Adirondacks. I was about to say next slide to myself. I apologize. So I, the first step in using IMAP is to make an account. So it's fast and easy. It's all free. And it actually doesn't use data when you're out in the field away from Wi-Fi or an internet connection. You can download the app in the Google or Apple App Store, whatever app store you're using, um, and you would make your account and set your preferences on the desktop version. Um, I've sent you links, but I will resend out those links of how to do that. Um, and when you have an account with your, you know, using your email, you can go from the mobile desktop version where you've set it all up, then to your phone where you can like start setting your preferences and use it um, day to day. And this is, you know, this is a 10,000 foot view right now. I have, um, in addition to all these very specific links I'll send you, I can also share with, I can answer questions over the phone or over email, and I can also set you up directly with our partners at IMAP Invasives. They're based out of the SUNY Environmental School Forestry um, in Syracuse, and they are funded and managed by the New York Natural Heritage Program. They also used to be part of the Nature Conservancy as well. Um, so this is all created for and by scientists and to make you all users and creators of science as well. Um, so I'll send you also a link to a deeper dive of how to create an account, how to use this um, program that we hosted on July 1st with our partners at IMAP. So if this is very fast, I apologize. I'm very caffeinated, um, but we'll, we'll make you uh, very confident users. So when you set your preferences, you've downloaded it from you know, the app store, you've gone to the desktop version to make your account, and then you're gonna go into your app and you're gonna set your preferences. You know, as I mentioned, it's, it's made for science, by science. Um, so it's not the fanciest app in the world. So that's why we have to kind of set those preferences ourselves. Um, I wish we had uh, that type of iNaturalist money, uh, but we don't. So, um, bear with me as I go through this. Um, you're going, and as and multiple states use it, and so the first step is to set your geography or your jurisdiction, and you're going to set that to New York. And when you set that to New York, the program is going to retrieve a big, big, long list of invasive plants and animals that it knows you should be on the lookout for in New York. But New York's a huge state, right? So what Chris is talking about in the Finger Lakes is very different than what we're talking about in the Adirondacks, even though they're similar. And they're very different than say, what you'd be finding or looking out for on Long Island, right? There might be saltwater uh, invasive species to think about there. There might be marine animals to think about there. So New York's a big state and that's why, in addition to sending you links to um, follow-up resources and trainings, past trainings to explore, I'll also send you a list of species to program your own personal list for if you're in the Adirondacks. Then there you get to the fun part. You're gonna add your observations. So I mentioned Pokemon Go. Um, please forgive me if that is a, an absurd uh, analogy, but really you're going out in the world, it's almost like a treasure hunt. You're changing your, your you're gonna adapt your behaviors to be on the lookout for these species when you're on a hike, when you're hunting, when you're camping, when you're boating, when you're biking, when you're walking the dog. And you're gonna be getting into the habit of, you know, 
finding observations and looking for observations and entering observations into IMAP. So there's this little button on the top of the screen called Add Observation. Um, that's, I think this is fun. Uh, you take a photo with your camera or you can upload it from a photo in your library, but really taking a photo with your camera is best because it shows exactly what you're seeing out in the world. Um, you'll select the species from your custom species list. As I said, it's going to pull up species from New York State, and then you're going to set your, your list to be appropriate for the Adirondacks. And then you're going to see if you saw it or you didn't see it. Um, sometimes it's very important, and depending on the species, for us to know where something is not versus where something is, right? Um, that's how we know if it's changing year to year, if something we've done has made a drastic impact over time. Um, and so select detected or not detected. And then you'll select a date. What day did you see it? Personally, I upload these maybe once in a batch a few days later. And so when I, when I remember to, or when I have working Wi-Fi in my rural you know, cabin, um, or if I'm able to go to the library and I have better Wi-Fi. And so I'll select the date. Add your observation. And then, so on this slide, you'll see, okay, I found water, I found milfoil. I was canoeing and I found milfoil or I was going out to, uh, you know, fishing and I saw milfoil and so I detected it. Here, I'll click this blue button, select the date. Seems so long ago in June. Um, and then I'm gonna click GPS because your phone is gonna have this internalized uh, mapping system and that allows us to just leave a little ping on this mapping software. So it's important to click GPS. Um, you'll select what type of project you're working under and I'll send you this information via email or I can talk to you about it over the phone. And um, this is particularly important, this time search, if you're not seeing something. So if, if you're saying, oh, I didn't see it, but your time search is only zero minutes or one minute, it might tell the person who's looking at the data that it might, it might be inaccurate, right? But if you looked for, if you were on a, on a hike for an hour, two hours, or maybe even three days out in the woods um, on your hunting you know, excursion, and you didn't see it, I'm going to trust that you, you did not see it because you were on the lookout for it. And then here in this next box, you'll select what size, you know, and this is just an approximation. Um, did you see just a monoculture of purple loosestrife out there? Did you see a monoculture of uh, Eurasia milfoil in the lake? And so on and so forth. And that gives the, the viewer of the information an idea of, you know, oh my gosh, we really have to go out there. We really have to make a management plan about this site. I really need to put it on my calendar to, you know, head up to that remote area. Um, and so all of these things are getting read by real people. And so that, that's kind of really exciting and should make you feel really all of this information and your hard work is really valued by real people doing real work. So this is just reviewing what I said in animation. Don't worry about the organization part. And then you'll want to take photos. So I, I included this image of what I would say is a very bad photo. <laughs> Let's try to take good photos. Um, a good photo would be clear. It would maybe have something in a relationship to give it scale. So say you're holding a handheld boot brush, like Chris mentioned, because you're going to keep your boots clean on your, on your hiking trip, on your hunting trip, on your biking excursion. Um, have something there for scale. And then later when you get to Wi-Fi, as I mentioned, you know, I do this a little bit later in the day. Say I saw three, four, five uh, different species. And typically I'm, you know, driving along and, you know, demand my husband stop the car so I could go out and take a photo or make sure it's reported. Um, try not to do that while I'm driving. Um, or definitely don't do this while you're driving. It's, it's too difficult. Um, so you're going to click these little boxes in the side when you're back in Wi-Fi, and you're going to be able to upload your selections. And it's going to ask you if it's okay to upload, and you say, yes, thank you. So that's a very, very quick uh, 
overview of how to use IMAP, why we use IMAP, um, the importance of using IMAP, and I will send out a lot more information on that. Uh, but we have some space for Q&A, and I know that there was a question previous, so also feel free to unmute right now um, to get some of the conversation moving along. And just to start us off, there was a question early on, Chris, um, from Home Folder, and they asked, um, they looked up what felt sold boots were. So I knew that from having a lot of waiters and having to do surveys and streams and, and rivers. So I had, you know, felt boots for my waiters. And so this person is asking that they've been banned in six different states. Is that a possibility in New York? Hmm. Uh, I didn't know that. I appreciate it question I did uh, vegetation grabbing on or wasn't based on your boots and, and you potentially trans one thing I, I didn't mention as I was speaking uh, earlier is that you know especially now and many of you are are scouting out your areas for the big deer hunt you know might be uh, coming up here in just a few weeks or something later on in the day. Um, be cognizant of invasive species now. Uh, now is important because you're, you're, yeah, you're, you're in tune with pain and habitats for the pain. Also, of invasives right now, and and then that hopefully we can utilize invasives. Let folks in the prism, Emily and her crew, know about that. But then it. it would be a good idea to steer clear of that invasive species patch. So mark it on your phone, mark it on that uh, GPS unit, uh, I mean, mark the location so that you know we're here at three in the morning to get off my stand. I'm not going to be through pale stalwarts or invasive uh, species patch you have found there. Um, you, can, you can get a little hoggy in the morning it's good lighting is certainly going to be a difficult and and not the same as say right now and or, or in the middle of the day so as we should be cognizant of right now as we're preparing and not sure if emily has oh left there we go I'm sorry. I'm just going to dive right into more of the questions. Go ahead, Emily. No, I, I have, oh wait, I think there are a few more questions. And that's what's so interesting about, um, you know, this group of people, of sports people who go out and procure their own food and participate in, you know, this real connection with the land is that there's so much timing put into it that I, I as a non-hunter, didn't really didn't really understand before and now we actually live on the same property as a fish and game club and so we've met the folks who own it and operate it and the families that go there um, and so this scouting activity and understanding how the landscape is moving or shifting or changing or what's growing where um, those are the exact types of people that you know we need to be hearing more from in order to report invasive species or to report you know the very who's going to notice that more than the person who goes out year after year after year right um and so i'm i'm just so glad that everyone's here tonight and i'm here to answer lots of questions going forward i know imap is it's you know it's this nerdy mapping software but um it's if you're really techie and you really want to make real change it's something that as soon as someone shows you how to use it it's it's like second nature. Um, yeah, I can't emphasize enough as a summary of to, you know, keep your boots clean, to keep your gear clean. If you're going out with an ATV, say to pick up something that you've field dressed, um, make sure your vehicles are clean, make sure, sure your boats are clean. Um, my family washed our very disgusting dog last night. It's not something we do often enough, but we definitely need to do more of. Um, and uh, it's all these behavior changes. You know, we didn't use to recycle 
I'll, uh, some of some people on this call probably even remember not having seat belt, but they're important things to, to change in order to benefit everybody. So without further ado, if there are no more questions, um, I, I want to just implore everybody to, you know, as I did, I wanted to just plug, you know, we have workshops coming up this winter that have specifically have to do with, you know, as a landowner to prepare for emerald ash borer on your property, especially if you're managing, you know, several one to several acres, if you have a woodlot yourself or you're cutting, you're selling firewood yourself. Um, we're also going to have workshops on hemlock woolly adelgid in partnership with the Adirondack Mountain Club. So those, um, those are gonna be scheduled and slated for January and February. Uh, there should be, if, if our partnerships work out and knock wood, if things stay at calm with COVID, that we'll have um, snowshoeing expeditions with the Adirondack Mountain Club around Lake George in order to go scout for Hemlock Woolly Adelgid. Chris, maybe you'd like to come do that with us as well. Um, and so everybody should uh, follow us on Facebook to stay in the loop, follow us on Instagram to stay in the loop. We'll connect you with your local PRISM, going to send a number of follow-up um, resources as well as a link to the recording of this video in case your Wi-Fi went out. We're all pretty rural here. Um, and I just want to say thank you to you all for participating and to Chris for joining us to share information. Thanks, Emily. Thank you, everyone. I will turn my video on for one second in order to wave before it crashes our internet in Keene Valley. So have a wonderful night and stay safe. And thank you so much in Clean Drain Dry and Clean, uh, clean Play Go. Good night.